and it's continuing to climb uh, as we put more gases in there. So the recent years, as you all know, have been the warmest years ever measured uh, on the planet. This is what is often called global warming. Um, if we continue on that trajectory uh, over the next uh, 80 years or so to the end of the century, and if we doubled the concentration of CO2, if we went from 400 to 800, which is where we're headed, uh, this is a projection by a computer model of how the temperature would change. On average, the average temperature might increase another three, four, or five degrees centigrade. But some parts of the world, especially in the north, northern latitude, would increase even more, six, seven, eight degrees. <coughs> this is where all the ice is, Antarctica, right? <laughs> and <coughs> that ice is melting already and would melt faster. So there's a chain of processes involved in climate change. I haven't actually talked about climate. So we started with emissions from human activities that are increasing the concentration of these gases in the air. Those concentrations are causing temperatures to rise because they act as a thicker blanket. And so the Earth has to get warmer in order to balance the incoming radiation. <clears throat> and those increases in temperature give rise to changes in what we call climate. What's climate? Climate is average weather. If you look at the weather every day over 30 years and get the average, that's climate. <clears throat> uh, you are fortunate to enjoy Mediterranean climate. We should enjoy it while we can. Yeah. Uh, so climate is more than just temperature. Climate is uh, how much rainfall you have, <coughs> uh, how much drought you have, <coughs> what kinds of uh, other weather events that uh, we all experience. <coughs> when the climate changes, there are consequences, particularly if the climate changes as quickly as it is projected to change. Uh, <coughs> What are some of those impacts? Well, uh, I don't expect you to read this, but why are we concerned about climate change? Because there are consequences that we don't like. <clears throat> there are consequences for the availability of water. Some parts of the world will get dry, <clears throat> uh, and drinking water will no longer be available. This is already happening in some parts of the world today. Um, ecosystems. <clears throat> Uh, we've heard about coral bleaching, for example, in Australia. Uh, all sorts of plants and animals will have trouble adjusting to rapid changes in, in climate. <clears throat> uh, food production will be affected. This has already been happening pr probably in places today like Syria. Part of the Syrian political crisis, in fact, is because they've had droughts and very low food production for the past <clears throat> 10 years. Uh, as temperatures warm, agricultural product, products can no longer be uh, supported the way they, they used to be. Uh, the coasts, <clears throat> most people in the world live uh, near a coastal area. So imagine a country like Bangladesh, <clears throat> uh, which is right at sea level. <clears throat> uh, and then waters rise and countries disappear. Today in the US, in how many of you have been to Miami in Florida? Some of you. Good, enjoy it. Miami may disappear by the end, not a joke, Miami may disappear by the end of the century. Uh, it's already starting to flood in many streets. The sea level is rising. <clears throat> and human health is also directly affected. Um, We've been hearing lately, for example, about the uh, Zika from mosquitoes. Mosquitoes like warm temperatures. <clears throat> the warmer the temperature, <clears throat> uh, the easier it is for mosquitoes to uh, uh, develop and grow and proliferate. <clears throat> if it doesn't get as cold in the winter, uh, the next generation uh, is larger. Those are examples of some of the effects of the indirects. 
Uh, so these are things that are um, of concern. We know more about some of them than others, but this is basically what is motivating that. And the point of this chart is to say that as the temperature, average temperature increases, which is what this is saying, one, two, three, four degrees, all of these problems get worse. Okay. Uh, as I say, we're seeing some of this already. Uh, it's not certain that it's related to climate change, but it is the kind of thing we would expect. One of the things we'll see will be more extreme events. Hotter days will be hotter. <coughs> uh, storms will be more intense. And we'll start to see things like this, which were taken from recent news clips in different parts of the world. <coughs> Fire, ice, floods, drought. <coughs> uh, these things are happening and may, may be uh, already part of what climate is, is causing. It's not certain. So that's why we're, we're concerned about this. And so what should be the objective? What, what should be the problem? Well, it's not a new problem. It was recognized 30 years ago <coughs> as a potential problem. In, in 1992 in Rio de Janeiro, <coughs> uh, all the governments of the world got together and they adopted through the United Nations what's called a Convention on Climate Change. <coughs> when politicians get together, uh, the thing that they usually agree on most are things that don't require them to actually do anything. Okay. <coughs> uh, that's what happened here, but they did come away with one very, very important uh, political statement in terms of what our objective should be, and it's one that makes sense. I wrote it down here. What they want to do, what they all agreed, 192 countries, is to stabilize the concentration of these greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So right now, concentrations are going up. What we want to do is stabilize them. Okay? <clears throat> keep, the, keep the level of the gases in the atmosphere constant. That's the only way to really avoid changing that balance. Stabilize when and at, at what level? That's where it gets a little fuzzy. Hmm? At a level that would, and these are words in English that <coughs> may be difficult to even understand for natives, prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. <laughs> dangerous, we understand dangerous. <laughs> That's really the only word you have to understand. <laughs> we want to stabilize at a level that's going to not be dangerous. Yeah. <clears throat> Anthropogenic interference means it's us and not nature. Uh, <clears throat> and that, that statement has been uh, on the books since 1992. There was an attempt uh, five years after that, uh, an agreement in Kyoto, Japan. <clears throat> Uh, to begin to try to take actions uh, in, in that direction. Uh, and that was uh, a first step, but for the most part, the political system has not really addressed that goal, would be my uh, judgment. <clears throat> okay? Not in a serious way, and not in a uniform way. Here and there, actions are very important ones, uh, <clears throat> but not until recently. So I'll come back at the end with what I think will be um, some positive news <coughs> uh, and a change in that direction, but uh, I'll fill the story in, in, in between. Uh, one of the things that has happened is that, um, <coughs> together with scientists, the political system has started to agree on what we mean by dangerous, what should be our goals. <coughs> and the general agreement is that we don't want to see temperature increases more than about two degrees above <coughs> uh, levels, uh, pre-industrial levels, so levels maybe 150 years ago, uh, <coughs> because that's when the effects become especially bad. So this notion of a two degree Celsius limit is kind of the, politi the political uh, target, uh, has been the political target in the last 
uh, 10 to 15 years. Um, at a meeting just last winter in December in Paris that I'm sure many of you know about, <clears throat> the government's actually said, yes, two degrees, but let's even try to keep it even smaller than that, one and a half degrees. Okay. Uh, we'll see now about what it takes to do that. Yeah. So that's the goal. I talked about goals. Uh, what do you need to do to reach that goal? Well, if you want to limit the concentration, the, the temperature rise, the effects to two degrees, then you have to limit the concentration in the atmosphere. This is the temperature rise and concentration. So the smaller the temperature rise, the lower the concentration. So two degrees means that you have to keep it about 450. Where are we today? 400. Okay, we're going up two every year. All right. So if we want to stay below 450, how much time do we have? <laughs> okay. You get the idea. Okay, it's a very aggressive target. It's a very aggressive target. In order to keep the concentration from getting much higher, what do we have to do? Remember that chart I showed? We have to do something about the emissions, not put not so much CO2 into the atmosphere. So we'd have to have large reductions in emissions of all those greenhouse gases in order to reach that target. How large? Well, it depends on a lot of things. It depends on how fast the economy will grow and also how many people will come into the world and lots of factors. Uh, but the best estimate from the science is 50% to 80% below where we have been recently. How easy is that to do? We'll talk about that in a minute. Okay? Uh, so this is a very powerful thing. Why does it take such a big reduction? It says at this end, it says we would have to almost stop emitting any CO2. We can't burn any petroleum. We can't burn any gas. Almost. Why such a big reduction? Uh, and the reason is something I mentioned earlier is because of the nature of these particular gases. Um, we talk a lot about different types of pollution. <clears throat> Many of you know a lot about this. So if you put polvo dust or SO2 from sulfur <clears throat> into the air, uh, many of those things that we uh, are used to talking about as air pollution don't stay in the atmosphere very long. If you stopped emitting them, <clears throat> it would come out. It would rain, literally rain out. The dust would clean out. The atmosphere would clean out. But not greenhouse gases. Their nature is that they don't react with things. They don't have a natural way of coming out of the air once they're in. They're very stable. <clears throat> uh, and so they come out only very, very slowly. So if you want to stabilize the concentration and keep it from growing, you have to keep the emissions very low. The best analogy I can think of is a bathtub. Mm -hmm. Think of the atmosphere as the bathtub. <clears throat> and we're filling it. We're filling it with gases. Right? And the level of the bathtub is rising. Why? Because the drain, very small. Tiny little drain, big faucets filling it. Okay. <laughs> What do you have to do to keep the level of the bathtub from rising? Gotta tighten the drain, right? Gotta tighten the drain. How much? So there's no more coming in than is coming out. Hmm? So if only a small amount is coming out naturally, you have to tighten the drain to match that, or else it's gonna continue to rise. And that's exactly where we are with, with greenhouse gases. You'd have to tighten the, <coughs> the faucets by roughly 50 to 80, 85 percent to match the drain. <coughs> uh, so what are the current trends? What's currently going on? How much of a problem is this? I found some data for Spain. I thought you'd be interested. I was interested <laughs> as to what's been happening. So here's greenhouse gas emissions <coughs> in Spain from 1990 uh, until about now, <coughs> 2013. Uh, this is the total in green. The red is CO2, 
from various sources. Uh, and these are other gases. So again, mostly CO2. Uh, so the good news is that lately it's been coming down. It's been going up for a long time, uh, and it's coming down now. We'll talk about why it's coming down in just a second. Okay. Um, if you look at the most recent year for the CO2, this is where the, the, the CO2 in Spain is coming from. Uh, the biggest sectors are energy, ele producing electricity, and transport. The two things that we all love the most our cars right, and our wall sockets, our <laughs> apparatos electronicos. Right? Those are the two biggest sources of the problem. When I asked Leo's class this morning, where does electricity come from? The answer was the wall. <laughs> okay. we, we need to understand that a little bit better. <laughs> but there's time. Um, the reason that the emissions have been coming down in the last few years, this is the total energy in Spain. This is petróleo, carbón, gas natural, uh, yellow, nuclear, hydro, y el verde es other renewables, wind and so on. Uh, it's coming down largely because energy use came down. Around 2007-2008. What happened in 2007-2008? <laughs> El crisis, el crisis, okay? So this is one way of solving the problem. <laughs> but it's probably not the best way. <laughs> okay? uh, but there has been some improvements in here. Spain has been a leader, actually, in some renewable energy growth. But still, by and large, as in most of the world, about 80% of the energy in Spain is from fossil fuels, from <clears throat> petroleum, gas, and, and, and coal. Uh, here's the situation for the entire world. Uh, the, uh, the entire world in general, this is again from 1970 to 2010, 40 years. These are the different gases. This big one is CO2. This is CO2 from cutting down trees, deforestation. So there are fewer trees to take CO2 out. It's like putting CO2 in. And these are other gases. But again, the main source has been fossil fuels for transportation and electricity. Everywhere in the world, those are the two biggest problems. Uh, uh, and uh, in fact, even though a number of countries have taken very uh, strong and serious efforts to reduce emissions, uh, overall, emissions have continued to grow up, to, to increase and grow. So this is 2010. 20, on that trajectory, we're going to continue to climb. <clears throat> what the analysis before says, if we want to avoid dangerous anthropogenic interference, we need to bring this level down to here. Not an easy problem. Okay? So that's the nature of the challenge. Um, and uh, that's where this notion of innovation uh, to try to uh, work in that direction comes in. So how can we get big reductions uh, in greenhouse gas emissions? Uh, here's a general um, equation that was proposed. Kaya is a Japanese scholar who proposed this simple equation a number of years ago uh, for CO2 emissions per year. And there are four factors that go into it. They all influence how much greenhouse gas we put into the air. One is population. In general, the more people on Earth, the more gases we put in, more energy, more food. Okay. Do we want to do something about eliminating a lot of people? Probably not. <laughs> As a national policy, uh, <clears throat> In recent years, uh, I know of only China as the only country that has actually put limits on population growth. And even those are now starting to come off. Okay? So 
governments and other, you know, controlling population is not really a viable policy option, but it's a factor. The other one is this, GDP is gross domestic product per capita. This is the amount of wealth, say a country <coughs> uh, generates in a year per person. So this is, think of this as affluence, the average dollars per person <coughs> okay, uh, in here. So this is basically the economy. So we can reduce emissions by getting poorer. That was the experiment we just showed you in since the crisis, right? Uh, raise your hand if you want to do that. <laughs> Most governments don't want people to get poorer. In fact, we want people to get wealthier and more affluent. So that's generally not going to be a strong policy option. It's these last two that are really the most important and where technology comes in. This is energy use per GDP. How much energy does it take to generate a euro of wealth? <clears throat> the argument is that the historical belief is that in order to grow the economy, you have to grow energy. And the question is, is that really true? Can we still grow the economy without growing the energy, using less energy to still grow the economy? That's where part of the challenge is, and I'll tell you the answer is yes, you can do that. But how do you do that? <clears throat> this involves a lot of technology, technologies that use less energy to produce goods, for example. <clears throat> this last one, CO2 emissions per unit of energy, is also technology. This has to do with the types of fuels that we have and the types of technologies that we use to produce energy. So these two factors depend strongly on technology. So what various groups around the world have been doing for some time uh, is experts try to put together in a computer model uh, a picture of the overall energy system of an economy, of a country, or of the world, <clears throat> and put in all of the technology options and all of the things that go into greenhouse gas emissions. <clears throat> Uh, and then ask the model to uh, calculate, to figure out uh, how can we generate the energy that we like and demand, but with lower greenhouse gas emissions. Okay? Uh, typically at the lowest cost to society. So these are some of the projections that give an insight into what, would, what it would take to get big reductions. Uh, here's one example that I show, I'm showing you for the U.S. Many of the other recent examples for the world are very cluttered. But here, when President Obama was elected, he, in fact, believes very strongly in climate change. Uh, and his goal for the U.S. Uh, is that by 2050, we should reduce emissions by 80% below what they were in 2000. The Republican Congress uh, doesn't feel the same way, so things have not been going too quickly, but this is, this is the president's goal, has been. <clears throat> so here's the year 2000, and this is the energy in the U.S. This brown is oil, <clears throat> uh, and um, I'm sorry, the coal, you know, you know, this is oil, coal, natural gas, other forms of energy. These other five are five different groups with five different computer models, and they're all trying to reduce emissions by 80%. <clears throat> uh, and because these models are complicated and they require a lot of assumptions and things go in, and different people are doing it, they get different answers. You ask five people how to do this, you get five different answers. And this is what these are. But these answers all have something in common. <clears throat> They're all trying to get 80% reductions at least cost for the U.S. economy by 2050. For different reasons, all of the models say we have to have major changes in the energy system. Where we get our electricity from, where we get our transportation energy from, where we get our industrial and home energy from. 
major changes. Different changes for each group, but they all have that in common. One of the biggest changes in this gray bar is reducing the demand for energy. We could shut off half the lights in this room, for example. Reduce the demand for energy, simple example. <coughs> but also change the way that we generate electricity and the way that we transport ourselves in vehicles. Uh, <clears throat> in order to achieve those kinds of goals, uh, a lot of technology innovation is needed. We have a lot of technology today that can begin to do this, but over the next several decades, we need better technology and we need to invent new technology. <clears throat> and as I told Leo's class this morning, they're the ones that are going to do it. Probably none of us. <laughs> We're too old. <laughs> but Leo and his classmates uh, are going to help solve this problem. <clears throat> One little girl asked if, it's, if a girl can win a Nobel Prize, and I, I think she's going to get one. <laughs> so what kinds of innovations am I talking about to reduce these emissions? Well, let me keep an eye on time here. <clears throat> um, we need innovations in lots of areas. Tech, innovations that reduce the demand for energy, as I told you, in everything, in buildings, in transport, in industry, in agriculture, all sectors of the economy. Uh, the less energy we need to do the things we want to do, uh, the better that we'll be. We need technologies that use energy more efficiently. <clears throat> uh, we need technologies that produce and use energy sources that are uh, have no or very low greenhouse gas emissions. Renewables, for example, wind and solar are classic examples instead of burning oil and carbon. And we also need, this is something that may be less familiar to, to you, something I work on a lot, technologies um, to capture and sequester CO2 from the use of fossil fuels. I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later. Um, so those are the innovations that we needed. How do you do innovation? How do you, how do you get these new technologies? So um, my colleagues in the social sciences study innovation processes, innovation in industry. How do you invent a new iPhone, for example? <clears throat> um, and there are different steps that academics uh, have identified that have these names, invention, innovation, adoption, diffusion. Um, <clears throat> The general belief has been what's so-called a linear, a linear model. First, you invent something. Somebody has a good idea. You turn it into a product. People start buying it and adopting it. And then more and more people start adopting it, diffuses into the technology. And for a long time, the general belief has been that this is kind of a linear process. All I have to do, for example, if I want to invent a better mousetrap, <laughs> Um, all you need to do is put some money in the front end for research and <laughs> voila, a better mousetrap, <laughs> okay? Uh, so it's a very appealing process, particularly for politicians because they have a lot of money and you just stick it in to invent it. And the only thing that's wrong with this idea is that uh, it's not actually the way the world works. Okay? Uh, it's not a linear process. Uh, a more realistic uh, model is a very interactive process. Okay? That is, uh, <clears throat> you have to build something. It's not going to work. <clears throat> you can make it better. People complain. You go back, <clears throat> and, and it gets better and better and so on. So there's processes. So research is important. But also these steps that are sometimes called learning by doing and learning by using. That's how we got airplanes. The first jet engine lasted one hour. Who would buy that? <laughs> Who would pay for it? Who would pay for it? Only a government would pay for it. The first computers, the size of this room. Okay. <laughs> how many of you would take those home instead of your, your iPod? Okay. Uh, so it takes a long time to get this process going, but uh, the, the importance of these different steps and the importance of these interactions 
uh, is often not appreciated. So what does that mean? Uh, what do you have to do and how do government actions, was the question the reporter asked me, influence this process? Uh, yeah, I don't intend for you to read all this, but one of the most important messages I think I want to leave you with is that governments, the people we elect, <coughs> uh, have a critical, I would say the critical role uh, if this problem is going to be uh, addressed. Governments can do two things that are essential for innovation. <coughs> One is they can provide various types of incentives. The incentive might be money to do research and development, which is traditionally what we do in academics and, and other organizations. But the incentives could also be uh, a whole bunch of other things that I won't have time to talk uh, about. One of them incentives is it's called government procurement. The government buys something. You know. <clears throat> the government bought the first airplane. <laughs> you know, it wasn't a very good bargain but that stimulated the companies to make better ones. The government bought the first computers. <clears throat> the government invented the internet. <clears throat> and that created incentives for private industries to make things better, because there was a customer. There was a market for the technology. People could make money by making things better. So uh, these are, se dice en español, calotas y palos, algo así. Sí. Sí. Pues these are carrots. Yeah, these are incentives, okay? but they're very important, and those incentives have had a very important role in uh, the problem even so far. In the U.S. and here in Spain and Europe, uh, governments have provided incentives for renewable technologies, like particularly wind, and here in Spain until recently, solar. <coughs> uh, this is, in the U.S., this is the growth in uh, electricity from wind, windmills, which were very expensive 20 years ago and are increasingly cheaper today. Uh, this is a result of incentives that uh, governments offer, tax credits and other kinds of incentives. A huge growth in, in this here and around the world. Um, this is a similar kind of picture. Uh, this is solar energy, wind, these are other kinds of technologies. This is the cost coming down as more and more people use it. Um, other things that you may be less familiar with, the government can give incentives, for example, for more efficient lights <coughs> that use uh, a tenth of the energy and still provide light. <coughs> uh, and we have products now that we can actually buy. This came from government-supported research and development. Uh, <coughs> here in Spain uh, and lots of places, Spain has probably been ahead of most of the world. <coughs> Painting roofs white to, it ref in Andalusia, for example. <coughs> It reflects the sun, it keeps things cooler. Uh, actually, now there are some paints from research that do a better job than white paint, uh, reflecting sunlight to keep buildings cooler and require them to use uh, less energy. Uh, <clears throat> some automobile manufacturers are doing the same thing. Cool colors that keep even air conditioning in cars minimal. So those are some of the important things that government do. People like carrots, no doubt about it. The other thing governments can do, and only governments can do, is require people to do things, regulatory policies. <coughs> These are the sticks, those, the palos, you say? <laughs> These are the palos. Uh, you can put a tax on emissions. <coughs> For every ton of CO2 you emit, quieres que pagar algo. Uh, you can put tax, there's other kinds of programs, cap and trade, ways that are requirements right, <coughs> uh, to do things. Technology, portfolio standards, performance standards. These things say, for example, technology portfolio says, for example, uh, by 2020, in Europe you have this, 20% uh, of your electricity must, must come from renewable energy. It's not a choice, it's an obligation. <clears throat> uh, if you want to build a new plant that burns coal, uh, you must control emissions uh, <clears throat> by more than 90%. These are requirements. These are things that governments uh, can do. So these are sticks, uh, <clears throat> and all of, uh, all of these policies influence different parts of that, uh, of that innovation process. <clears throat> Uh, here are some examples <clears throat> that I put together of, of uh, how some of those policies have, have worked in the past. 
these are various <coughs> sources of energy in buildings, transportation, and industry. And here, too, there are <coughs> regulations that have been imposed. This is a complicated picture, but I want to spend just a minute and walk this one through to you because it's a wonderful example of the kind of innovations that we need more of. It's refrigerators, La Nevera. <coughs> uh, <coughs> in 1971, 30, 40 years ago, the refrigerator was the appliance in your house that used more energy than anything. <coughs> and in the state of California, in Los Angeles, Unidos, California has been a pioneer in environmental issues, always. <coughs> California passed some requirements that said, if you want to sell a refrigerator in California, it has to consume no more than tal, okay? If you look at the market, there were some refrigerators that were much more efficient than others. <clears throat> uh, and California said, from now on, you, everybody must be as efficient as what somebody else can already do. And then those stand, and so this is the energy use of a refrigerator from 1950 to 2000. It was growing and growing and growing. When standards came in, it started coming down. And then the standards got tighter. And it kept coming down. And then after a while, the US government said, hey, why don't we make everybody in the US do that? And so the federal government started imposing standards. Today, a refrigerator, a new refrigerator, uses about 20% of the energy of a refrigerator 40 years ago, 80% reduction. That's good news. But man, you, people will say, ah, it's going to put us out of business. We won't be able to sell refrigerators. This is El Precio. So price went up a little bit, but mira, the price has been coming down. Uh, companies are smart. They can figure out how to do things often more economically. And so the price of this technology has also come down as it saved energy. And the third thing, this other line, is the size of a refrigerator. Huh? Refrigerators have gotten bigger and bigger. Ahora, a maximum, depende del tamaño de la puerta. When they bring a new refrigerator into the house, <laughs> really, <laughs> it's limited. Sometimes I have to take the door off just to get it through the door. <laughs> okay. So that's why it's been leveling off. <laughs> this is limiting the size of doors. <laughs> so refrigerators have gotten bigger, cheaper, and more efficient. Uh, that's a wonderful um, uh, kind of outcome. More of these stories are what we need in, in the innovation area. Um, here's another uh, area in a different area of technology where government regulations Sticks, not carrots, has made it important. This is automobile. So in the US, as I think you know, we talk about miles per gallon in vez de litros per cien kilometer. So <clears throat> these are standards that the government started imposing back in 1975 for passenger cars and light trucks <clears throat> uh, in miles per gallon. So <clears throat> more miles per gallon means it's more efficient. You can go further on one gallon. Uh, we haven't, so initially, this, this was in response to the first energy crisis when oil was very scarce. Uh, and it, old cars were about, uh, well, they were actually about 13 miles a gallon. The standard went up to 28. So they started getting efficient. It was very good. But then it didn't change for 20, 30 years. Now, Obama. This is Obama. <laughs> We're heading to 55 miles a gallon okay, from about 15. Okay. How do you do that? <laughs> okay. uh, a lot of new technology. Uh, the traditional cars have gotten better, but then new ki kinds of cars are, uh, are starting to appear. Hybrids, you have many of them here in Spain. <clears throat> Combination of batteries and a motor. Um, cars that use fuel, not petroleum, but derived from uh, biomass. 
<coughs> all electric cars, okay? <coughs> possibly a hydrogen car from fuel cell. Okay? So technology is changing in response to government forcing to get more efficient. Um, I mentioned earlier uh, other kinds of standards for uh, uh, electrical energy. Uh, again, as these technologies here is um, wind and solar, as more of this has been used, the price has been coming down. Okay? And it's a combination of carrots and sticks that has done that. Um, I mentioned this thing called carbon capture and storage, carbon sequestration. See, the problem right now is that we get in the world about 85% of the energy is from fossil fuels, from burning things. And especially electricity, <coughs> not so much here in Spain, but in the US, and especially in China, India, other parts of the world, uh, a lot of the electricity comes from burning coal, carbon. <coughs> and that has more CO2 per unit of energy than other fossil fuels. <coughs> so is there a way that you can continue to use coal because it's so plentiful and cheap without the CO2? <laughs> and the answer is yes, there is a technology that <coughs> now has been built. This is a power plant in Canada <coughs> that burns coal. Uh, and this building over here is a technology that removes the CO2 from the gases before it goes up the chimney. Uh, and this is a picture of what it looks like, not on coal, but on a gas plant. In Spain, you have a lot of natural gas power plants. Okay? So it's possible to actually remove 90% of the CO2 from power plants today. So why aren't we doing it? One is that it's relatively expensive. Usually the more you do, the more expensive it is. The other is there's still a lot of political um, resistance or lack of acceptance of the need to do this, of the need to do that. Uh, a lot of people, though, around the world, including here in Spain, are trying to develop processes that are less expensive. Uh, I have a friend and colleague uh, in Oviedo uh, <coughs> who's been working on one concept. This is a pilot plant that we visited last year. Uh, uh, to try to develop a, a, a somewhat less expensive way of doing that. So this is still a work in progress. There's a lot of discussion around the world on this technology. Uh, its advantage is that uh, it can provide a solution to climate while dealing with the reality that in a lot of places, uh, high carbon fuels like coal and natural gas are going to continue to be used. The other reason is it's typically part of a cost-effective solution. The analyses that uh, the IPCC and others have done say that without this technology, the cost of those big reductions could be much, much higher <coughs> compared to other ways of getting very deep reductions. Uh, <coughs> we've also seen in the US that when you impose requirements that say you must reduce 90%, this is what happened with not CO2, but SO2. Instead of dioxide of carbon, dioxide of sulfur, health problem. <clears throat> when Congress said, you must, these are, this is the number of patents. Okay? So everybody started trying to invent new ways of doing that, okay? a stimulus. Okay? And the result was that new technology got developed, and the cost came down in the same way that we've seen it in others. So these things can happen. Uh, I'm almost finished, so what kinds of policies do we need to do this? Uh, I believe the best way is a combination of carrots and sticks, incentives and requirements, because ultimately you have to create a market for a technology. The innovation is going to be done not by the governments, but by people in industry and, uh, and universities and research laboratories, but they have to have a reason to do it. <coughs> uh, and the reason is, uh, it's required to, to be in business. Uh, and that kind of combination can work. So this is still a work in progress as to how quickly governments will impose those requirements. <coughs> uh, one of the things that will be very important is sustained research and development. <coughs> uh, it can lower the cost of, uh, of these uh, technologies. 
Uh, one of the problems is that until just very recently, um, research, this is the US money spent on different areas of science and technology. 1980 uh, to 2008. <clears throat> this is the budget for energy, the orange line. The US, of all people, has been spending less and less, less on energy research. We've been spending more and more and more on health, <laughs> all right? which is what we always care most about. Right? And these are other areas, space and other sciences. Uh, so unless we turn this around, a lot of this innovation isn't going to happen. Um, so um, just to end on a, 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 on a positive note, there are two promising developments as of the end of last year that address both of the things I've been talking about. <clears throat> uh, as I think a lot of you know, last November and December in Paris was a meeting of all the world's countries to talk about climate change again. And two things came out of that that are very important, and let me just close with that. <clears throat> uh, one was a political agreement, and the other was a technical agreement called Mission Innovation. The political agreement, <clears throat> I can leave this with you to read later, but the political agreement was 195, all the countries of the world said, yes, it is important to keep the temperature well below two degrees to avoid dangerous interference, and let's even try to get one and a half degrees, which we're almost there now. <clears throat> um, for the first time, everybody agreed to do something, something. Each country will decide and has determined what it thinks it can do in the next five years. In some cases, it's not very much, but it's something. In other cases, it's more ambitious. Obama in the US wants to reduce CO2 by 30% from power plants. China has made some commitments as well. <clears throat> the countries have agreed that every five years, they're going to look at each other's plans and things would get tighter. Okay? So it's a trajectory. <clears throat> They've agreed that rich countries will raise a lot of money to help poorer countries both develop emission reductions and adapt to some of the changes that will happen. <clears throat> uh, and that ultimately, uh, they want to balance the faucet with the drain in the bathtub. <laughs> okay. So uh, this is an important and encouraging start. Uh, the other part of it is this thing called mission innovation. Actually, one of the sponsors for one of the uh, ideas for this came from, not from the government, from Bill Gates. You know Bill Gates? <clears throat> he made a little money selling <laughs> computer software. Um, <clears throat> uh, Bill Gates has been very interested in energy, and he challenged the governments of the world last year uh, to uh, double, double the amount of money they spend on energy. Uh, and in Paris, they agreed to do that. So, uh, so the governments have now agreed over the next uh, five years, uh, next 10 years, to uh, increase the spending on energy research and development uh, by twice as much as, as it is now, a major, a major development. Okay? So what will the future bring? Uh, we have a crystal ball back in my office uh, in Pittsburgh. And whenever we want to predict the future, I bring my graduate students in, we shut the door, <clears throat> we say the magic words, and then we can <laughs> see the future. Uh, so here's what we saw. <laughs> we saw the agreement in Paris as, as a very important first step uh, in, not a first step, but an important recent step uh, in the effort to mitigate climate. It's the first time all the countries of the world have agreed to do something together. Uh, the fact that we need sustained support for research and development of technologies uh, <clears throat> and mission innovation uh, is a very positive sign that uh, we'll be able to attract bright people like Leo and his students into this world to uh, uh, help develop these new technologies. But still, in the longer term, and this is the question mark, is whether the political systems in my country uh, and uh, uh, 
many other countries will uh, rise to the challenge and develop the strong policy drivers that, uh, that are needed uh, to get those large reductions, not small reductions uh, in emissions. So we'll see how this turns out. Uh, it will depend a lot on future policy for climate. Uh, and uh, invite me back in five years and I'll tell you what has happened. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>
technologies. They do it in Europe as well, in the US uh, uh, also. Uh, so my personal view is that it could be an important bridge. <clears throat> it's not going to be a substitute. It can't be seen as something that says, okay, since we're doing this, we don't, no longer have to support renewable. We have to do everything. Uh, and it's also not going to happen that quickly. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, and it's not just about coal, it's about natural gas. We think of natural gas often as a clean fuel. It's not so clean. <laughs> it's cleaner than coal, but it's still part of the problem. And those different analyses for the U.S. that I showed you uh, suggest that even natural gas may need carbon capture and storage. And the other reason it's an interesting technology, and I didn't want to get into this <clears throat> because it might be confusing, is carbon capture and storage together with biomass. So think of biomass as an energy source. People like biomass, renewable, right? <clears throat> Grow a forest, cut it down, burn the wood. It takes <clears throat> carbon out of the air. So think about biomass together with carbon capture and storage. What happens? The trees take carbon out of the air, and then the technology puts that carbon into the ground. Negative emissions. <laughs> Negative emissions. We may need negative emissions in the last part of the century to stabilize the atmosphere. Uh, and so the technology of biomass together with carbon capture, um, while it still has a lot of other issues, uh, could be part of the solution as well. So I, I view it as a technology that's part of a portfolio. Uh, and it's not going to be an either or. So it's a false premise to say that if we do this, we will not do that. That's not right. We can do all of it at once. What we need to do most, <clears throat> this is what I talk uh, with Leo's classmates about, <clears throat> uh, the only really clean energy that I know of is the energy we don't use and don't need, <clears throat> right? <clears throat> uh, because we've gotten more efficient and we've changed our lifestyle a little bit, whatever. Uh, <clears throat> And that's also the cheapest energy uh, in the short term. So part of that package is, <clears throat> while we tend to think and, and focus mainly on the supply side of energy, uh, the demand side is really where the low-hanging fruit is <clears throat> and where a lot of the innovation uh, can be most, most productive and, and most economical. So it's really an all-of-the-above strategy. You just can't exclude any option. That's a long answer to a, uh, an important question. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for that. That was very, uh, very, very interesting. I work in health. I'm a health researcher. <clears throat> Sorry, I've done it for a while. One of the concerns we have is we work in health projects, and so few times we talk about the impact of the environment on health. Mm -hmm. And the other issue is we work in health in country. I've worked in health in countries, um, emerging economies, so Far East Asia, Bangladesh, mm -hmm. East Africa. And the one thing I noticed was when dealing with poverty, which is usually, that's why we talk about GDP and growth, in dealing with, in, in dealing with poverty and alleviation of poverty, we're constructing big plants, big factories. And I've seen in countries like Bangladesh <clears throat> that were very green and very environmentally sound are now, I mean, dredges. So do you have a comment? I mean, are we too late? Because places like Cambodia now are following the same patterns we have in the Northern Hemisphere, but without conforming to controlling um, for these pollutants, for example. I wonder if you had a, a comment on that area. Thank you. About what developing countries? Yeah, what developing countries and, are and doing how and how they're following mm -hmm. us in the Northern Hemisphere, but not necessarily as part of the Paris uh, Declaration and so on. Thank yeah. You. Uh, unfortunately, I think it's developing countries, poorer countries in general, <coughs> um, that are going to be most in need of uh, uh, what is called adaptation adopting uh, to changes in the climate because those are the, those are the countries and the people that will be most affected by some of the impacts that I showed you earlier. Wealthy countries can generally afford to, at least in the short term, <clears throat> build higher walls and move people. But where do a million people in Bangladesh go when the sea level rises and there's no more Bangladesh? Um, so part of, part of the agreement in Paris actually is to provide uh, the, uh, the amount of money that's being talked about was $100 billion, billion per year uh, 
uh, for starters, <coughs> for the rich countries to give uh, to the poorer countries, both for adaptation and for beginning to control uh, emissions. Um, there's no one solution that fits all locations, and, and so you have to tailor solutions to, uh, to local situations. Uh, <coughs> a lot of the kinds of projects that organizations like the World Bank have been supporting are usually these big projects in places where it just doesn't make sense. It's, it's, it's simpler and more efficient and, uh, uh, and better ways of doing things. So, uh, so part of that is education as well. That's part of the government incentives, They're just uh, training people to understand what appropriate technology is in, in a given context. Um, it's actually a lot of those um, same countries, particularly some of the island nations uh, that were <clears throat> the most forceful people in Paris in getting that language to say, hey, two degrees? How about one and a half? <laughs> okay. And the next time they come back, they can probably say one, and they say, well, we've already done one. We're living in it today. Uh, <clears throat> uh, that's where the negative emission technology may come in. But um, I, I think uh, you know, parts of the world are becoming more sensitive to that. Uh, we'll see how it plays out. Yes, sir. Thanks, thanks a lot for a great talk and giving enormous perspective on this theme. I, I'm Nick van Hulst, a Dutch guy working in a photonics place here. But this Paris guideline of two degrees is translated into 450 ppm CO2. Roughly. Roughly. But that assumes that the amount of CO2 we have generated over the last 50, 100 years is instantaneously translated into temperature. It's as if we would now stop generating CO2, the temperature rise would just stop. But that's not true. I mean, it takes an enormous time to, right. to react on that. So yeah. if we're talking about 25 years to limit to 450 ppm, that there will be, a, the past will st still pursuing us on what we did, and it'll grow a lot first, not? Um, yeah, it's gonna, we're already at one, but if you could, if you Maybe more than 25 years, but you know, but it's all it's all that order. That's why the, uh, the analysis here was like through 2050, so maybe it's 40 years. Um, it's going to grow from one. It's currently at one, and if, if we kind of if we were able to magically keep the concentrations where we are now, mm -hmm. you're absolutely right. The temperatures would continue to increase for some time, yeah. okay. and it might come closer to that two degree target. Uh, so it's a, it's a gradual process. It might take uh, 50 or 80 years to, to reach the equilibrium. The, the numbers that we're talking about, the two degrees, is kind of an equilibrium value. And we may, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty in those numbers. It's not a hard and fast number. Uh, but we'll, what is clear is that if, if, you can st if we can stabilize those concentrations, um, those targets are, in principle, achievable. In, in the long term, the stabilization. Um, so we'll, we'll see. The, the other way of thinking about it <clears throat> that, um, again, I didn't want to complicate it too much, but um, the, the, the 450 parts per million, whatever the number is you pick, <clears throat> uh, implies a budget. <clears throat> uh, it says that if, <clears throat> if you want to stabilize at that concentration, given where we are now, <clears throat> Think about how much carbon is already in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> if it goes up to 50, 450, there'll be so much more carbon. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> that's basically the budget. It says, uh, the, we want to stabilize the bathtub here. <laughs> Here's where we are now. The difference is essentially a budget. It says, you can only put so much carbon into the atmosphere over the next 50 years before you get to this level. Um, and that number is about uh, 1,000 million metric tons. <clears throat> so we basically have a car, I mean, there's, a, there's a known budget for the world <clears throat> to, to achieve that level. That means we could put a lot more in now and not so much later, or we could slow down now and put, it, yeah, that's, a budget is a budget. Uh, but uh, once that budget is reached, then you're in, you're in a different, you know, different atmosphere. So um, 
the notion of a budget is useful in the sense that it, I, I think it helps connote that <coughs> you have some flexibility in timing, yeah. but, uh, but not in the total quantity uh, of carbon that you can still put in the air and, and achieve those targets. So you're not going to overshoot. If you, if you can't stabilize at 450, you're not going to overshoot the target. No, so, well, there's a little bit of slop. Yeah. <coughs> but if you continue to put more carbon in and overshoot 450, then for sure. Mm -hmm. okay, so that one chart that I showed, if you're interested in it technically, I can give you the pictures, uh, kind of shows kind of the range of uncertainty. And it depends on what other, I've been focusing on CO2, but <clears throat> other gases are also important. Uh, methane, there's a whole bunch of other gases we haven't talked about uh, <clears throat> that are chemicals invented by uh, people, by people in laboratories. They have long chemical names. Well, some of them are chlorofluorocarbon, the same things that cause these ozone holes, and it's a different problem, are also greenhouse gases. <coughs> um, they're also part of the problem uh, as, as well. So, uh, also, so it depends on what the mix of gases is over the next couple, couple of decades. Um, it's not all CO2. Um, I'm David Tavara. I work at Autonomous University of Barcelona. And, uh, well, thank you for your talk. And I also, uh, I like this idea that we mustn't exclude any option. Uh, just a couple of, of comments first. Uh, probably you have seen the, the latest data from NASA of 2016 that it shows that we are now at 1.3 already anomaly in terms of global warming, which is very close from what Paris said about uh, that we mustn't go beyond 1.3. In fact, I also saw the comment by James Hansen from NASA that says that the Paris Agreement was a, was a fraud. Huh? Uh, and it's a fraud because it really didn't uh, agree. But basically, everybody agreed to do whatever they wanted. Uh, so, of course, it wasn't possible to disagree. Uh, so, uh, w when you have a, 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 a commitment to do whatever you want, of course, you, 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 must, you cannot disagree. So, to, and, and then, if you add the an intended contribution, national intended contributions, then you actually, the United Nations said that we are going to shut up uh, beyond two degrees. We're going to, uh, so, to some extent, uh, now people are pondering uh, to what extent Paris is as a good agreement uh, as uh, was sold, uh, sold at, that, at that particular moment. So, uh, before with this landscape, just, uh, the question is that people are saying that uh, uh, the type of technofix solutions, which I, I also can, uh, uh, support, uh, are important, uh, play a role, as I said at the very beginning, but they're not enough, huh? because are part of the conventional approaches to climate change, and be because we are now already too late uh, to, to meet this two degree target, or even uh, we need some kind of transformative solutions, a more in integrative type of solutions. I'm, I'm, I'm I'm deeply studying on that. I have no idea how to deal with that. Maybe you can help me to understand what kind of un, uh, more transformative solutions we, we need in order to uh, cope with the new situation which just already is happening. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, um, uh, so yes, I, I know there are uh, scientists like Jim Hansen, who I know, uh, <coughs> who believe that Paris wasn't nearly enough. And everybody knows that. <coughs> Uh, each country has agreed to do what it chooses to do. Um, <clears throat> but the good part is that everybody has uh, committed to do something. And that's the first time this has happened. Okay? <clears throat> uh, what really matters is uh, what we do in the US and what China does and a few other major developed countries, uh, both because we're a major part of the problem, and also because uh, of the leadership <clears throat> that major companies provide. Uh, I th <clears throat> I've been critical of US policy for exactly that reason. They say, why should we develop if China isn't? Well, the answer is uh, China will eventually do what the US does. Nobody uh, <clears throat> wants to be seen as technologically inferior. <laughs> uh, and that's what's happened in other conventional pollutants, right? The U.S. took the leadership, for example, in controlling emissions from automobiles. <clears throat> and then the Europeans, you all looked around and hey, look what the U.S. is doing. We can do that too. And then China just tried to do one better. We can do better than the Europeans. And, and so there's a lot of that synergism that shouldn't be, um, shouldn't, shouldn't be forgotten uh, in, uh, in that. So 
Uh, we'll see. We don't know yet. I mean, this has only been not even a year since the agreements. The question will be uh, whether there are uh, enforceable ways of understanding what countries are actually doing uh, and whether, in fact, um, <clears throat> you know, the expression in English, peer pressure mm -hmm, uh, is uh, going to be as important as many of us believe it, it, it will be. Uh, so the notion that every five years the countries have to both report what they've done, <clears throat> they have to have a way of making sure other countries can monitor what they're doing to see if they're committing their, up to their promise. <clears throat> uh, and if they're not, there are ways, both hard and soft, <laughs> of putting some pressure that may or may not work, but we hope, we hope it will. And then every five years, the notion that we're gonna uh, come back with a new plan and get a little bit better, um, I think that, to me, that is the most workable, realistic, solution in, in a global context <clears throat> that, that could, have, could have come out. Up until now, all of the other agreements f since 1992 have been a handful of nations saying, well, we're gonna do this and we're gonna do, and everybody else doesn't have to do anything. Without everybody saying we're gonna at least do something, they recognize that it's the problem, uh, we're not gonna get anywhere. So is the glass half full or half empty? Uh, I, I see this in a, in a more positive light, uh, and we'll see five years and ten years from now uh, whether, whether I'm right uh, or, or, or some of the cynics are. We'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. I think, I think the other thing that's happening, particularly because a lot of these extreme events that have been occurring recently, which we can't particularly pin on climate change, but it's consistent with climate change, um, I, th I think a lot more people around the world <coughs> are becoming sensitive to the fact that, hey, this stuff really, I, I really have a personal stake in this. Anybody who lives in New York City who lived through Hurricane Sandy <clears throat> and got flooded uh, or put out of business <clears throat> um, has a different feeling today about sea level rise and extreme events and the potential for climate change. They listen more carefully. They say, oh. yeah. um, we had drought, we had floods last week and. France and Germany that were unprecedented. All these weird things are going on. They're all kind of related to weather. Uh, people are not stupid. They'll start putting things together if the scientific community can speak about this honestly. Uh, and then uh, at that point, when people feel they have a stake in actions, that's when the political system starts to respond. Up until I've been working in environmental and pollution uh, issues um, all of my career. Um, <clears throat> when air pollution was a major issue when I first started, um, why did we start to control air pollution suddenly in 1970? It's because uh, the one thing people care about more than anything is their own health. <laughs> <Okay? clears throat> uh, and when you start seeing evidence that certain pollutants in the air not only make you sick but can kill you, <laughs> uh, that gets people's attention. Okay? Uh, climate change doesn't have that same urgency, and that's been part of the problem. So we say, well, it's something in the future, and uh, I don't really, nothing, it's not going to affect me today. Uh, but now we're seeing ways that it can affect. Even talking about the Zika mosquito and how that will change in a warmer climate, uh, <clears throat> uh, and whether your children will be more susceptible to diseases because of climate change. Those are the things I think. Um, as we continue this discussion, we'll get uh, more and more people's attention and hopefully will be translated uh, into political uh, actions. The reporter who was talking with me just before we started, uh, his last question was, what can we do as citizens? And the standard answer is, you turn down the lights and the thermostats. And I, I gave him a different answer, which I had. Uh, <coughs> I think the most important thing we can do as citizens is elect political people who will take action in these areas. Uh, because without those government actions, both carrots and sticks, uh, nothing's gonna happen. Okay, so I think that uh, we wait, uh, we look forward to have you here again back in five years time. Okay. So thank you very much you. for your interesting and pedagogic talk.